Thank you very much, uh, Professor Schmitz, for the um, generous introduction. And uh, I'd also like to thank Jan for enabling this paper to go ahead, given the COVID-19 situation. And uh, it is a shame not to be in Bonn in person, but thanks to the wonders of modern technology, this sort of thing can um, continue to go ahead. Um, it's also an honour to speak in this series um, in honour of the late Joseph Miller. Um, one of the enduring aspects of Miller's work was his um, commitment to getting um, scholars of slavery from this or that period talking to one another. Um, and part of this commitment to interdisciplinarity can be seen in his uh, laborious efforts to compile, publish and update annually his worldwide bibliography of slavery. But it was also to meet up with um, scholars who, scot who studied other places and periods um, at interdisciplinary conferences. Um, and I had the fortune to, to meet with Miller um, twice at such events, uh, one in Nottingham, the other one in, in Boulder, Colorado. And the, the Bond Center for Dependency and Slavery Studies is encouraging very much the same sort of thing, the, the sort of interdisciplinarity. So it's a real pleasure to be included in the, in the schedule um, of talks. So thank you for this. So one of the challenges um, of studying slavery in global perspective is keeping up with the debates in all of the various disciplines included um, within um, global slavery's purview. It takes a mammoth amount of um, learning to be able to write something like Professor Zoyska's Handbuch Geschichte der Sklaverei. Um, what people like me who just work in, in single areas more or less can do, however, is to present their material in a way that um, hopefully is intelligible to scholars engaging uh, with ancient history, uh, ancient history, but whose specialisms lie in other areas. And so I hope that what I present uh, now will make sense and not assume too much specialist knowledge of the audience. Accordingly, I've provided a handout with all of the passages of Greek um, accompanied by English translation. Um, my subject is the intersection between the themes of slavery and, and economic development, something that has been and continues to be fiercely debated uh, in relation to the United States South in the 18th and 19th centuries. And my focus, however, is on Greece between around 800 and 400 BC, so what we call the archaic and early classical periods. Um, I'm going to structure the talk as follows. Um, the first part will look at recent work on economic growth in archaic and classical Greece, focusing on the motive forces that scholars have recently um, emphasized as driving this economic development. Um, as we'll see, um, although slavery has not been ignored, its role in uh, generating growth has not been viewed as central uh, and the specific ways in which it contributed to growth have not been very thoroughly investigated. The second section of my talk will look at the, the standard view, uh, at least in English language scholarship, um, of the development of slavery in the archaic period, so the seventh and the sixth centuries BC, and that's based on the work of Sir Moses Finley, who's the, the most kind of um, influential student of ancient slavery of the, the 20th century, arguably, at least in um, the UK and America. It's here that I'll spend most of my time and engage in detail with the evidence um, that is set out on the handout. And here I am to show that um, there are many problems with this model of development and that there's a pressing need for an alternative explanation for what happened. In the final part of the talk, I'd like to set out this um, an alternative um, model of development that in my opinion harmonizes much better with our evidence and places uh, slavery as a, a central element in the explanation of economic growth in archaic and early classical Greece and in particular I'm going to stress the link between slavery and monetization. So um, if you look at the handout um, let's begin with the histogram on the first page and um, this comes from um, Josh Ober, Professor Ober's recent book, um, The Rise and Fall of Classical Greece. And by the way, every bibliographical item that I mentioned can be found in the bibliography at the end of the handout. So back to the diagram. Although we lack um, proper statistics from antiquity, um, archeologists working over the past century have accumulated a large body of evidence. And Ober's histogram represents the trends that emerge from this archeological data set. In particular, I'm talking about several types of archaeological evidence. The evidence of house sizes, which, speaking very generally, grew from the hovels of around 800 BC. Um, 
to the generally speaking much larger and more comfortable houses typical of the fourth century BC. I'm talking about uh, settlement size and density measured both by direct excavation and field survey, skeletal evidence both for the stature of individuals and nutrition as measured via anthropometry and bone isotope studies, the number and size of shipwrecks and so forth. I'm sure Oprah would agree that there's plenty of room for debate on the fiddly details about how one measures and represents these trends, but there's general agreement among scholars that the material record does indeed show an, uh, an upwards trend throughout our period. And let me be clear in saying that this is not just a case of an expanding population that causes the economy to grow, although that is part, certainly part of what we can see going on. Standards of living, seem generally to be growing during this period as well. So the economy grew in what modern economists would call aggregate and, and per capita terms. So the archeological evidence shows then very much what ancient writers like Thucydides and Diodorus who are next on your handout and claimed had occurred in the several centuries that we're talking about, a general rise in population and prosperity. If we can accept this picture as being broadly true, then what factors drove this uptick in population and prosperity? Recent work um, emerging especially from neo-institutionalist um, studies of ancient economic history um, has emphasized in particular a number of institutional factors. So things like private property regimes, the growth of law and order, and accordingly the provision of reliable courts to enforce ownership rights as well as contracts. Um, Ober's book also looks at political institutions and in particular the spread of democracy, which he argues provided the aforementioned institutional developments, law and order, courts, that kind of thing, but also limited inequality and a limited exploitation of the, the poor by the rich and fostered innovation and the dissemination of knowledge. So these ideas represent the most recent wave of explanation in a debate that goes back several decades and includes contributions by scholars like Chester Starr and Keith Hopkins, who emphasize the importance of urbanism and the expansion of markets. For the various drivers of growth identified by modern scholars, I refer you to item two on the handout um, and the bibliography cited there, full details in the bibliography at the end of the handout. So, um, Ober's explanation of growth triggered a fiery exchange with Costas Philosopoulos back in 2016, and, who are, and Philosopoulos argued that Ober had ignored slavery in his explanation of growth, an accusation that Ober then vehemently denied. And you can find the review and the response on their respective Academia EDU pages, um, but some of the, uh, the uh, quotation from Philosopoulos is on handout item three. And what I think is fair to say is that although slavery has not been actively denied in the recent neo-institutionalist studies on growth, neither had, has it been in, integrated as particularly central to explanations of growth, and it's usually been mentioned in passing or, or in footnotes. Um, this is a little odd because, um, as Jason Porter has recently pointed out in a paper of 2019, slavery can be viewed very much from the neo-institutionalist angle. And um, I quite agree. And Porter's paper, paper um, treats classical Athens, however. So what I aim to do in this paper is to look at diachronic change and during the um, preceding period. So that takes us to the central point of this talk. Um, so what happened in the archaic period in terms of the development of slavery? And what's the evidence for it? And how has this evidence been treated in existing scholarship? and how this, does the development of slavery um, interlock with the, um, economic growth. Um, to put things rather basically, our evidence amounts to two different kinds of texts. Um, the first sort is what we could call contemporary evidence, so it's evidence from the archaic period, um, but it's poetry, uh, namely the Homeric epics and Hesiod's uh, works and days. Um, all of these um, date to about 700 BC give or take 50 years, we can't give precise dates. And the second sort of evidence is textual evidence dating to the period around the death of Alexander the Great, so 323 BC, um, but that describes events and conditions about three centuries earlier, just a little less than three centuries earlier. Um, what I'm talking about in particular is the picture of the reforms of the Athenian statesman um, Solon, 
Um, these are usually dated to his um, archonship, his magistracy in um, the year 594-3 BC. And this is sketched in a, a text known as the um, Athenaeon Politeia, or Constitution of the Athenians, um, which is uh, attributed to Aristotle, but was probably by uh, one of his students. But so, so that I don't run over time and uh, overqualify everything, I'm just going to refer to the author of the Athenaeon Politeia as Aristotle, um, because we don't know the actual name of the, the author. And I'm going to refer to the Athenaeon Politeia as the Athpol, so hopefully that will save me some, some minutes. So it's this text, the Athpol, that has been strongly preferred uh, by modern scholars as the basis for historical reconstruction of archaic labour conditions in Attica. Um, Attica is the region in which um, Athens is located and which it controlled in antiquity. Um, Sir Moses Finley followed the German ancient historian Edward Meyer in viewing slavery as economically um, unimportant and, and insignificant in the period reflected by the Homeric epics and uh, Hesiod's works and days, so Greece around 700 BC. Instead, Finley saw the, the labour force of the early Athenian elite and by extrapolation, um, elites in other parts of Greece, as being composed of um, debt bondsmen and sharecropping tenants. In Finley's view, it was Solon's reforms that marked a key turning point and since Solon um, allegedly abolished debt bondage and hectamerage, uh, the system of sharecropping that the Athenian elite apparently used for um, their agricultural labour force. Um, so Solon's reform on Finley's view, um, at a stroke, deprived the Athenian elite of its agricultural workforce, meaning that the elite had to find a, a replacement. And that replacement, in Finley's view, um, was composed of imported barbarian slaves. And Greece quickly thereafter transformed into a slave society. So that's the Finlian expl explanation of what happened um, in, uh, in terms of the rise of archaic slavery. And so uh, uh, at item four in the handout, you can um, see some uh, relevant um, quotations from Finley, as well from um, Paul Cartledge, um, published in 2002, that illustrates the enduring popularity of um, Finley's explanation. And this explanation still occasionally um, gets uh, uh, supported today. So next, le le let us uh, look in detail at uh, how the text of the Ath Paul, which is, as I said, is, is fundamental to Finley's model, um, let's look at what it says. So you skip down to item five on the handout. So here's what Aristotle, let's call him, writes about the situation confronting Solon um, almost three centuries before the his own day. So we're talking about um, around 600 um, uh, BC. Here's the text. It came to pass that for a lengthy period, factional, uh, factional strife existed between the elite and the masses, for the con uh, constitution was in all respects oligarchical, and indeed the poor themselves, and also their wives and children, were in slavery to the rich, and they were called pelatai, so dependents, and hectameroi, a uh, sixth part men. Um, for that was the rent, so one sixth, that they paid for the land uh, uh, of the wealthy that they were uh, cultivating. All of the land was in the hands of the few, and if the, the workers ever failed to pay their rents, they themselves and their children became liable to seizure, and all borrowing was in the security of the body down to the time of Solon, for it was he who first became the representative of the demos people. Thus, the harshest and bitterest thing in the political system for the masses was their slavery, but they were deeply frustrated for other reasons, for, one might say, they happened to have no stake at all in the system. So just a brief qualification, when Aristotle says that the Athenian demos was enslaved to the rich, he's writing metaphorically. Um, the language of Dulea and slavery is commonly used in Aristotle's time uh, as a way of articulating social asymmetry. Um, but the point about um, the consequence of not paying the rent is becoming a slave of the rich wouldn't make any sense um, if we took this uh, uh, description of Dulea, slavery, literally to mean slavery sensu stricto. So he's just saying that the poor were in subjection um, to the rich 
asked in all these ways. Um, I want to focus in particular, though, on a couple of the claims in this passage. The first is that um, all the land was in the hands of uh, the few. This is important. Um, and the second is that the um, Hectimroi, the sixth part men, um, were tenant farmers, sharecropping tenant farmers who worked um, on land belonging to, to the rich. These two claims are central to Finley's reconstruction. Um, and we therefore need to understand how Aristotle got hold of this information and to assess how reliable it is. So in order to do so, let's um, look at the sources that Aristotle um, had um, for Attica um, in the days of Solon, so almost three centuries earlier. So the, the sources that Aristotle had um, were of three sorts. So the first were laws. Um, we know that Solon was a famous lawgiver. Um, we know about many of Solon's laws from later writers and um, leaving to one side the modern debate about the authenticity of specific laws. Everyone agrees that Solon passed lots of laws and that these laws form the, um, the core of the Athenian um, law code that was in force in Aristotle's day. As it happens, uh, Professor Schmitz is working on a book on this topic, which is eagerly anticipated, so I'm um, looking forward to that. Um, anyway, Solon's laws had originally been inscribed on wooden objects called curbes and axones. Um, I'm one of those who thinks that these are different words for the same item, but we don't need to get into that debate. Um, but, so originally um, inscribed on wood, um, and Solon seems to have passed a lot of these laws. And Plutarch, a Roman writer, um, a Greek, well, a Greek writer of the Roman period, and claims that um, he meant well, he mentions an eighth law of the 13th axon. And so that implies that there was quite a lot of legislation, Solonian le legislation originally. And Solon's laws replaced, um, mostly replaced an earlier um, law code of the lawgiver Dracon, who was active around 620 BC. Um, apart from Dracon's law on homicide, which was incorporated into Solon's um, uh, law code. After that point, more laws were passed um, piecemeal um, by the Athenians during the rest of the 6th century and throughout the 5th century. Um, although these were uh, inscribed on stone stelae um, placed here and there. Um, at the very end of the 5th century BC, Solon's laws and Dracon's um, homicide law uh, were revised and re-inscribed on stone alongside these um, later laws by a committee um, of anagraphes, so inscribers. So in, in the fourth century BC, Athenians commonly referred to their law code, um, this consolidated re-inscribed law code as the, the laws of Solon, despite the fact that it, uh, this code contained a lot of later legislation that had been integrated alongside the original laws of Solon. But the fact that Aristotle at Athpol 8.3 refers to, and I quote, laws of Solon that are no longer in use, close quote, uh, means that he was able to distinguish between the reinscribed Athenian law code um, and the original Solonian axones, the original wooden um, uh, tablets on which these uh, Solon's laws had been inscribed. So in other words, the axones survived into, down to Aristotle's day and could be read. Uh, they weren't simply discarded after the reinscribing process. And we know that um, among the works of Aristotle uh, that are now lost, one was uh, composed of five books um, and, and entitled On the Axones of Solon. So there was a literary tradition about this um, that passed down throughout antiquity. Um, Plutarch um, claimed to have seen the remains of the original axones in Athens in his own day, so about um, AD 100. So that indicates that they had been kept carefully as a kind of museum piece. Um, but the fact that he gives us a lot of um, technical detail about the laws indicates that he had a access to a reliable literary tradition that probably um, um, descends from um, Aristotle's work on the um, axones of Solon and, and that kind of thing. So my basic point is that um, Aristotle had access to the original laws of Solon, which gives, gives you an um, uh, original source going back to the time of the reforms. The second um, uh, source that Aristotle had to use that went back to the time of the reforms is Solon's poetry. Um, Solon was a famous poet. His verses were treated, were, were treasured by later generations of Athenians. They were passed down in writing. 
um, and they were well known to um, classical Athenian audiences. Um, much of Solon's poetry um, was political, um, but it speaks in very general terms and doesn't um, give us much in the way of technical details about individual reforms. Um, not much of Solon's poetry is now lost, but significant um, chunks of it are quoted by later writers, not least of them Aristotle and Plutarch, and a good deal more is preserved by writers like Diogenes Laertius, writing in the third century um, AD, or um, Stobaeus, writing in the fifth century AD. Alain Dupluy makes the important point that these fragments that we have today um, were decontextualized from their original setting and then recontextualized into the works of the authors that quote them. But it's generally agreed that um, classical era writers like Aristotle um, would have had full access to the um, entire corpus of um, Solon's poetry, giving them um, a second authoritative primary source going back to the time of Solon himself. The third um, source is oral tradition. Um, so by Aristotle's day, and Solon was con considered to be the father of Athenian democracy by many, and many stories circulated about him and his activities. Although we might term oral tradition a primary source, insofar as it represented a continuous chain of storytelling that stretched back in time to the time of Solon, these traditions are the least reliable sources upon which Aristotle drew. It is well known to anthropologists and historians that the historical value of oral traditions degrades over time unless special pains are taken and to guarantee word perfect transmission and that new material, new stories can always imperceptibly um, be added to the original um, information at various points along the chain. So with the, the, the period of time between Solon um, and Aristotle, 270 years, something like that, um, we're well past the two century threshold for tradition to remain even vaguely faithful to the original message. What is more, it's likely that many of the stories told about Solon um, in the classical period and afterwards um, are not simply um, degraded versions of one's historical stories, but um, outright fabrications invented at later points in time. Nevertheless, several technical terms seem to have been passed down intact um, to Aristotle's time. Um, terms like hectameros, sick partman, possibly Sysakthea, more on that in a moment. And another possibility is that these technical terms um, were found in Solon's laws, but at any rate, we have a good, there's a good reason to think that th uh, these terms um, date back to Solon's day, even if some of the, the stories are um, suspect. So what I want to do next is to look at um, Aristotle's research method, how he made use of these three kinds of sources, and explain how um, he reconstructed a picture of Attica uh, nearly three centuries earlier. Um, in particular, I want to draw your attention to some mistakes that Aristotle made in interpreting um, his sources, the, the, the laws and the poems. And for it's in the mistakes that Aristotle makes that we can really see the way he works um, as a historian. Um, this will give us a good sense of how Aristotle interpreted the past and allow us to evaluate the, evaluate the claims he makes um, about the elite owning all of the land and that the Hectemeroi were um, tenant sharecroppers. Um, so the mistakes I want to look at, there are many we could go through, but I think two of the most obvious are, are the ones we'll, we'll use as case studies. So the first is the idea that Solon reformed Athenian coinage. And second is the idea that his most famous reform, which is known as the Sysakthea, the shaking off of, of burdens, and the idea that that was a, an abolition of debt. Uh, there are actually um, other examples too, but as I say, well, constrictions of time mean that we've got to be selective. So first of all, the alleged Solonian um, reform of coinage. So according to the local historian of Attica, Androsian, uh, and to Aristotle working about uh, a generation later, Solon um, reformed Athenian weights, uh, measures, and coinage. And this is the next passage of your handout. As P.J. Rhodes has rightly pointed out, however, um, coins were not minted in Athens until several decades after Solon's reforms. And Solon cannot possibly have reformed Athenian coinage any more than Otto von Bismarck could have passed legislation uh, regarding aeroplanes. So how did these fourth century writers commit such an error? And two points clarify the situation. 
First, um, ancient writers had no access to, to a, a reliable chronology of coinage, such as that produced and using the methods of modern, modern numismatists. Um, accordingly, they had no clear idea of how long coinage had been in use in Attica. Second, the Greek terminology of coinage, so the word drachma, um, the word obol, uh, which was the uh, one-sixth of drachma, um, th this terminology was identical to the ter terminology um, for um, weighed silver before coins were introduced. Um, so before coinage appeared, um, the typical way of um, making a, an exchange in the marketplace was commodities offered, uh, a certain amount of silver is charged, and then that silver is weighed out. It's just little little lumps, irregularly sized lumps of silver called hack silver, and the, the weight the weight is key. So there's no um, regular unit like a coin until um, the middle of the sixth century BC. And um, so obviously, what um, Aristotle and writers of his age. Um, the mistake they made was to look in some of those laws, see the word drachma and the word obol, and think, ah, drachma is a coin, obol is a coin, Solon must have reformed coinage. Um, so it's an anachronistic reading of these texts um, based on a lack of knowledge of the um, actual um, chronology of when coinage came into play. Um, the second and um, more interesting um, error that Aristotle makes is in relation to this uh, major reform called the Sysaktheia, the shaking off of burdens. Um, this word is likely to be Solonian or at least archaic and was passed down in tradition because it was only ever used in relation to or in analogy with Solon's measures. It's only ever used like that in an ancient text. Just like the phrase um, New Deal is associated squarely with Franklin D. Roosevelt or you can have a Green New Deal, but um, again, it plays on the same um, specific reform. Now, by the fourth century BC, um, there was a debate over exactly what the Sysaktheia had actually involved. Um, according to Aristotle in the Athpol, it was an abolition of debts, and Plutarch um, later agreed with Aristotle. So, how did Aristotle know that the Sysaktheia was an abolition of debts? Well, what's really interesting is that in the Ath Paul, he um, shows his working out and how he's, uh, he, he tells us how he got to that conclusion that the, um, the Sysak Thea was a, um, uh, an abolition of debts because he, he cites a poem of Solon where he picked up the clue that gave him this answer. And that's the next passage in, in your handout. Um, so this is what we call, we, we call Fragment 36 West of, of Solon's poem. Um, and in this uh, poem, uh, so Ar Aristotle mentions the Sysak Thea, says uh, as evidence that this was a, a, an abolition of debts, Solon says, and talks about um, the black earth. So he talks about personifying the earth as a goddess and um, th that there were horoi fixed in many places on the black earth. And then Solon removed these horoi and and before that point, of time, point in time, the black earth, the dark earth was enslaved and afterwards it was free. So more on the horror in a second. Why might this tell us anything about debt cancellation? So as my doctor father, um, Edward Harris has pointed out, when uh, in Aristotle's own day, um, it was very common in Attica, specifically in Attica really, um, to mark a piece of land or building with a stone called a horos, okay? Horoi is the plural of horos. Um, and this kind of stone would have an inscription on it and it would tell passers-by that the property that it's placed upon had been um, pledged as collateral for a loan so you can see on the next page of that uh, of the handout a photograph of one of these horoi along with its inscription uh, the the text that telling the the readers uh, its readers that the property um, on which it was placed was uh, uh, pledged as security for a loan so this is i think what you call verfendung but uh, my pronunciation might um, not quite get you there um Okay, Aristotle clearly thought that um, when he read Solon's poem about removing horoi, that this signified a removal of the sort of debt horoi that he knew from his own day um, as um, placed around Attica recording um, debts. And therefore, putting two and two together, he worked out that the size of Thea must have been a, a blanket abolition of debts. And many modern scholars have unquestioningly followed Aristotle's um, view um, Harris, however, has pointed out a serious problem with um, Aristotle's um, view. 
Um, and that's that the, the use of horoi as uh, debt markers is not attested any earlier than the fourth century and BC. So um, two centuries uh, after Solon wrote his poem. So if you look just at um, earlier archaic texts, the word horos always just means a boundary marker, um, one that divides two pieces of land. And you can employ, the, uh, the term might be employed literally, in simile or, or in metaphor. Um, in Harris's view, Solon, by saying he removed the horoi, is simply saying that he removed um, division from the land of Attica and through evoking the image of, of, the, of removing property dividers. But he's not making a reference to specific land reform or giving us some clue to um, the nature of the Sazakthea in this um, line. So although some, some scholars have objected, um, Harris has reading really gained support from usages of the term horos in other archaic poems, and indeed from elsewhere in Solon's own poetry. The terms used literally in Homer's Iliad in Book 21, um, the goddess Athena seizes a large boundary stone, a horos, and she throws it at Ares, and it hits him in the neck and knocks him unconscious. Um, the term is used figuratively too in Book 12 of the Iliad, Homer uses the image of two men um, arguing about a horos, a boundary stone, and that divided their plots of land as a simile for the wall that surrounded the Greeks' encampment in, at Troy and held apart the Greek and Trojan armies. Um, in one of his own poems, Solon uses the simile of a boundary stone, a horos, to describe how he held apart the um, hostile factions of the demos and the elite, so again to express division. Uh, and Solon says that if someone um, with, uh, with a worse character than, than him had um, occupied his position of authority, and I quote, that this person would not have restrained the demos, nor would he have stopped until he had stirred up the milk and got rid of the cream. But I stood in no man's land between them like a boundary stone, a horos. So the figurative use of horos as signifying division has a parallel within Solon's own poetry. Um, at any rate, um, Plutarch in chapter 15 of his life of Solon um, follows Aristotle by saying that most writers agree that the Sisyachthaia was a cancellation of debts and that Solon's poems warrant such a conclusion. And then he goes on to cite exactly the same verse of Solon's poem as Aristotle did, talking about removing horoi. Anyway, there's much more to be said on this point. Um, for example, there is an alternative theory by Androsian that the, um, uh, that the Sazakthaya was actually a reduction in interest rates, which nobody um, believes today. Um, but due to constraints of time, I just want to underline um, one point. Uh, nobody in the 4th century BC really knew what the Sazakthaya had involved. Um, they knew that Solon had enacted a famous reform called the Sazakthaya, that had been beneficial for the poor, but there was no explicit testimony in, in the laws or poems that told people exactly what that was. Um, and therefore, fourth century writers like Aristotle and Androsian had to theorize and speculate. So Aristotle, um, or Aristotle's source, and found a line in Solon's poetry about pulling up horoi that looked to a fourth century reader like a reference to abolishing debt and believe that this clue was the key to solving the riddle of the Sisyachthaia. Alternatively, Androsian thought that this um, view was wrong, and having found references to changes in weights and measures in Solon's laws, thought that he'd find the real clue to the nature of the Sisyachthaia. So my point is, is not that we should believe Aristotle instead of Androsian, which is a very common mistake, or to believe Androsian over Aristotle, which nobody does, but to, that we should disbelieve both of them and they were both engaging in imaginative reconstruction both grasping at straws and that observation does not get us any closer to solving what the Sazakthaya actually was for which there are a number of different plausible alternatives but it lets us see quite clearly how Aristotle worked as an interpreter of the archaic Athenian past and as a reader of um, archaic poetry and archaic legal texts. He was not, so he was not simply relaying a body of, um, uh, of um, clear fact from the archaic period to his readers, um, but was engaged in uh, active reconstruction of the past. Um, and his guide to that past was four things. So the three sources I mentioned, the laws, the poems, um, an oral tradition, and then interpreting that um, 
in line with his his own intellect and, and sense of, of how society worked. And so these four things in combination led to the reconstruction and given in the Athpol. And as, we, as we've seen, um, he made mistakes. So what about the details that Aristotle gives us uh, about the elite owning all of the land and the hectameroi being sharecropping tenant farmers? In my opinion, um, Aristotle could not possibly have got the detail about um, the elite owning all of the land um, from the laws or the poems. Um, and the second idea, um, so the idea that the hectameroi were tenant farmers, uh, creates uh, very difficult problems of logic. So I'll run through these now. So first of all, we, we know rather a lot about um, inscribed archaic law, and it must be emphasized that there is practically nothing in our extensive corpus of early Greek legal inscriptions that provides detailed information about the configuration of land ownership or the concentration of land um, uh, among specific aspects, the specific elements of any Greek society. Um, it's highly unlikely that Solon's Law has mentioned details about the elite owning all of the land, and anyone familiar with the genre of inscriptions knows that this is not the sort of information that these kind of laws record. As for the poor being a class of tenant farmers, well, archaic laws do some, sometimes mention subordinate legal status groups like slaves or debt bondsmen, but never in a way that allows us to formulate generalizations about um, how common they were in the economy or what um, position they occupied in the largest uh, social structure and uh, structures of labor. So in short, um, Solon's laws are an unlikely ca candidate as a source for Aristotle's assertion. And the second, um, as we've seen, um, Aristotle and Plutarch are, are not shy of citing their sources on this or that point of Solon's reform. So they can cite specific laws, sometimes even by axon number, and they can quote whole sections of poetry that support their arguments. It's therefore significant that Aristotle cites no authority at all in the claims about the um, elite owning all of the land and the poor being a class of tenant farmers. If such details were mentioned in Solon's poetry, um, why did Aristotle or Plutarch not provide a quotation? The, the likely answer is that Solon's poetry did not mention this particular detail. Third, the idea of um, mass wide scale agricultural tenancy is itself dubious. Uh, the phenomenon is almost wholly um, unknown from genuine archaic sources. In Homer and Hesiod, as we'll see shortly, uh, rich men own large farms and the workforce of these farms is slaves and hired labour. Um, people a bit further down the socioeconomic spectrum, so sub-elite, um, but still fairly well off, people of the Hesiod sort maybe, and own smaller farms, but with similar workforce and slaves and hired labor. And the poor, if they do not work hard, according to Hesiod, risk having to sell their farms to richer neighbors and may have to go onto the road becoming a hired laborer, a thess, or a beggar, tochos. And I um, know of only one archaic text that refers to tenant farming, and it's an oblique reference. Um, Achilles is, uh, the, the hero Achilles is ghost, claiming in Book 11 of the Odyssey that he would be uh, rather be a, a hired labourer working for a poor akleros man, that means a man without his own plot of land, who therefore must be a tenant. Um, so he'd rather be that um, than king of all the dead. So if tenant farming was ever dominant in any region of archaic Greece, any mention of it is mysteriously dropped out of surviving archaic texts. Another good reason to suppose that tenancy was not the dominant form of land tenure lies in the results of archaeological survey, which has shown that the Attic landscape was far from full in the 6th century BC. We do not know much about the claims that local notables may have asserted over tracts of uncultivated land, but like Hesiod's father a century earlier, who moved from Asia Minor to Ascra in Boeotia in central Greece and obtained his own private land, there was virgin land to be taken into private cultivation in an archaic Attica. And this would have been a more attractive option than locking oneself in a predatory sharecropping system. 
So um, next are these problems of logic, which I think are more interesting. Um, so let's um, suppose that um, Aristotle and Finley are correct and that Solon did indeed liberate a class of sharecropping tenant farmers from their harsh labor conditions. Um, well, Tracy Rill has pointed out, uh, she's asked the following question, if we assume that, that um, as, a pre uh, uh, as a premise, where did the, these farmers then work after, the, after Solon's reforms? So if they'd been freed from their conditions of being sharecroppers, what land did they cultivate then instead? Solon explicitly tells us in fragment 34 of his poetry that he did not share out the land of Attica equally among the Athenians, which can plausibly be taken as a reference to demands for a redistribution of land that he did not accept or implement. So if Aristotle was correct, then Solon, um, far from doing the Athenian demos a favour, um, accidentally made their conditions a lot worse. So instead of being locked into a predatory share, share cropping system, they were on the road and starving to death. Of course, if we disbelieve Aristotle on the points about um, the elite owning all of the land and the Hictemeroi being sharecroppers, um, then the problem vanishes. And the second problem of logic is that um, we know around the time that the Peloponnesian War broke out, so 431 BC, that the landscape Attica, the region around Athens, was cultivated by a large number of um, small farmers. So if the elite had owned all of the land just before Solon's time in 600 BC, um, how come um, the land happened to be owned by a much broader swathe of society um, a century and a half later? Um, if Solon didn't redistribute the land, as he says he didn't. Um, partable inheritance isn't a good enough explanation to um, account for the differences um, between land tenure in 600 BC, if we believe that the elite owned all of the land, and land tenure in 431 BC, when it was rather different. Of course, again, if we disbelieve Aristotle about the um, 600 BC um, conditions, about the elite owning all of the land, then the problem vanishes. So I think there's a straightforward way of explaining how Aristotle believed that all the land was in the hands of the few. And at this point, it's worth reminding you that by Aristotle, I've so far been referring to the author of the Ath Paul, who was actually probably one of Aristotle's students. But in the politics, um, a work that is actually um, by the real Aristotle, there are some views about how political regimes correspond to specific forms of socioeconomic structure. And um, Aristotle has six categories of um, political constitution. And these comprise um, good and bad variants of rule by the majority, rule by the few, and rule by um, an individual. Um, and it's the bad version of rule by the few, an oligarchy, that I want to focus on. And um, if you recall earlier in the Ath poll, we're told that the constitution of Athens prior to Solon's um, reforms was thoroughly oligar ol oligarchic, something that might be concluded from reading um, Aristotle's poetry. In his discussion of oligarchy in the politics, Aristotle presents four increasingly extreme gradations of oligarchy. And this is the passage at the top of page five in the handout. So in the mildest sort of oligarchy, there's a significant minority of the population that ex exercises political rights. And these men possess modest amounts of property. As property comes to be concentrated in the hands of fewer and fewer men, the nature of the oligarchy becomes more extreme. In the fourth and most extreme version of oligarchy, and property has become divided among a tiny elite of plutocrats who are all individually and enormously rich. And this then leads to metabole, so constitutional change through revolution. So let's assume that um, the author of the Athpol believed his teacher Aristotle's views about the economic basis of these different political regimes. So this provided him with a, a normative framework about how different sorts of constitution align with different kinds of socioeconomic structure. Then let's uh, suppose that he tried to figure out which constitutional and socioeconomic category that Attica prior to Solon's reforms belonged to. So he could see from Solon's poetry that the problem lay in a greedy elite exploiting the poor. And he knew that Solon had been brought in as a mediator when Athens was on the brink of revolution. So putting two and two together, and he categorized pre-Solonian Attica, uh, Attica as an extreme oligarchy, it's thoroughly oligarchic, which inevitably um, meant assuming that the land belonged entirely to an arrow elite. Okay, that's a, the assumption of the Aristotelian framework. So the author of the Athpol um, 
uh, also had to locate a historical detail that had passed down to him from Solon's time. That's the, these Hectamoroi, sixth part men. Who were they? Well, if we assume that um, these uh, that, that the land belongs to and um, just to the uh, a narrow olig oligarchy, then it follows as a matter of course that these Hectamoroi would have been sharecropping tenants working on the land because they didn't have their own land because the land belonged to the few. So I mentioned a, a moment ago about how Aristotle and reconstructed, so the Athpol reconstructed Solon's Attica using both the primary sources at his disposal, the laws, the poems, oral tradition, and his own assumptions about how the world worked. And also we looked at how those assumptions sometimes led Aristotle to make mistakes like on the um, abolition of debts or the coinage reform. Um, I think that the most straightforward explanation to, of Aristotle's claim about the elite owning all of the land also came not from his source material, his primary sources, but from the assumptions that he held about how the world worked, um, assumptions that were um, shaped by his schooling in Aristotelian political theory. And this is in line with the arguments of scholars such as Lucio Bertelli, Mirko Cannavaro, and um, Alberto Esu, who've shown that the Athpol and if not a mechanical arrangement of Athenian history, according to the assumptions of Aristotelian political theory, was nonetheless profoundly influenced by it. So, what does all this mean for the story of the evolution of slavery in um, archaic Greece? Well, first of all, it means that we should be very careful of taking the account of Solon's reforms in the Athpol at face value. This does not require us to doubt the historicity of all of our sources for Solon's reforms, as, for example, Mosse and Hansen have done. Rather, it simply requires us to acknowledge that Aristotle was not engaged in simply relaying uncomplicated historical facts about 270 years earlier, um, but in historical reconstruction, and therefore that we should not blindly place our faith in his claims about configuration of land tenure um, in Attica all those years and earlier. So I think that the detail about the elite owning all of the land has to be rejected as a fourth century fabrication. And I'm sure it's true that the elite in Solon's day were major landholders, but it's only the assumptions of Aristotelian political uh, theory that require all of the land to have belonged to this elite. Um, and this also frees up from interpreting um, hectamerage in terms of agricultural tenancy, um, which um, sends us into logical cul-de-sacs. Um, now, this doesn't solve the argument about what hectamerage was, and I admit there are several um, alternative views that could be true, um, but it does allow us to see a picture of Solon's reforms that actually reflects what Solon says in his poems. Um, Strife between the rich and poor, with the rapacity of the former led to riot by the latter. So this undoubtedly had its economic aspects, but I don't think we need to um, believe Aristotle's entire reconstruction of land tenure and agricultural tendency. So, that's the fourth century sources. Um, is it possible to derive a more credible reconstruction of the development of slavery and labor relations in Attica from actual contemporary archaic sources? Uh, well, yes, um, uh, Homer and Hesiod, um, as uh, uh, Hans van Wies, uh, William Thalman, and my doctor father, Edward Harris have shown, um, show that slavery was absolutely critical to um, uh, uh, elite um, wealth in uh, around 700 BC. So I think I'll give you some passages that I won't get into in detail um, uh, in the handout, um, some key passages from um, Homer um, on this. But if you look at Harris's essay in the bibliography, it shows very um, convincingly, I think, that um, slavery was the go-to source of um, elite um, extra, uh, elite forced labor. Um, as, er as early as a century before Solon's time, and therefore Solon, um, Solon's Attica, probably something similar was happening um, there. So I propose uh, a model where we don't have a single trigger point like Solon's reforms, where Greece suddenly and rapidly transformed into a slave society. Um, rather, it was already a slave society at the um, time of Homer and Hesiod. Um, what happened in the centuries that followed was not the emergence of slave society, but the tr internal transformations in the structure of the slave system with a gradual and growing preference for foreign imported slaves and kicking in as processes of state formation and the institutionalization of citizenship came to protect insiders from enslavement. So to get back to the, um, to conclude, to the main point of my talk, how does this organic model of development connect with the story of growth 
increased during the archaic period. So for sure, um, the points that Costas Blasopoulos identified, and these are quoted um, back at item three in the handout, these are correct. So in other words, that the exploitation of slaves by citizens helped to raise the living standards of citizens over time. So this is a big component of slavery's contribution to growth. But I think there's a more specific phenomenon that deserves um, emphasis. This is the monetization of the Greek economy in the second half of the sixth and then into the fifth centuries um, of BC. Actually, before that, that's coinage, but um, the century before that as well. If you look at the various drivers of growth um, listed at item two on the handout, and specifically the expansion of markets and technological change, then monetization is a key component. Um, monetization itself is a technological advancement. And this um, had a couple, two phases. The first phase, the use of silver bullion, hack silver, uh, and second, and the introduction of coinage from the mid 6th century onwards. So what's the link between slavery and monetization? Well, there's a very interesting and stimulating paper on this um, uh, relationship by Raymond Descartes that was published in 2006. And he, like me, argues for a, an organic model for the development of archaic Greek slavery. And he sees that slavery follows a wave of monetization in terms of hack silver. So on Descartes' view, um, silver comes first, and um, it makes trade more efficient, um, and therefore more slave trading occurs, more slaves are imported to Greece, that creates slave society. So Descartes' model, um, uh, silver first, and then slaves second. Um, my proposal is to invert the causal sequence of Descartes' model by asking the following question, um, who actually mined the silver in the first place? And um, Descartes doesn't argue, uh, address this problem in his paper, but in, in my opinion, the only credible answer is slaves. To begin with, it's worth noting that the, the sources of silver in the Aegean, principally the islands of Thassos and Sifnos, um, and most importantly, the district of Lorient in southern Attica. In all three cases, um, uh, in, uh, these uh, uh, silver deposits came uh, in terms of uh, uh, lead ores and the result was that silver extraction was a very toxic process. You can see some quotations about this at item 7 on the handout, whereas uh, Tracy Rill points out that both the smelting and cupellation station, stages um, of the silver extraction process at, at um, Lorien in Attica um, involved the production of toxic elements. In the classical period, and um, so but in the fifth, late fifth, and then into the fourth century um, BC, these mines in Lorraine were um, worked by a large number of slaves, maybe um, at least 10,000 in the 340s BC, maybe over 30,000. Xenophon describes the calculus of mine contractors, um, such as the Athenian general Nicias, who apparently owned large numbers of mine slaves that were rented out on the condition that the number of slaves was kept up to strength. So in other words, that when a slave died, a new one would be bought by the contractor to fill the vacancy. So these slaves were um, treated mostly as disposable cheap labor. So my contention is that when silver mining got underway on a significant scale, so in terms of Lorien, that means the late sixth um, century BC, it was slaves who provided the labor from the start. And the reason is basically institutional. Slaves were different from other kinds of worker in that they were the personal property of their owners and as such could be compelled to do tasks of a sort that other kinds of worker couldn't easily um, uh, be uh, compelled to do. The property rights that the slaveholders held gave them the um, legal tools to open up areas of primary uh, resource extraction that simply could not have been exploited to anywhere near the same degree by other available kinds of labor. So in other words, um, Jason Porter is right in pointing out that a neo-institutionalist explanation should and can include um, slavery. And you don't need to be a Marxist, therefore, to uh, accord slavery a, a central role in economic um, development. What about other uh, possible or alternative um, sources of mine labor? Um, early Greek elites often had a fractious relationship um, with the demos. Um, but I concur with studies such as um, Professor Schmitz's book on neighbours and village life uh, in seeing the demos not as a, a inert passive victims of all powerful elites, but as having customary rights and expectations that elites were ex expected to observe. Uh, references in Homer to the lynching of members of the elite who violated this code, and especially to the contents of Solon's poetry, 
show that there were limits to what elites could get away with in terms of exploiting the demos before sparking an all out um, riot. To be sure, individual Athenians exploited and sold into debt slavery are part of what we find described um, in Solon's poems. But we also find the demos rioting in response to this uh, misbehavior, elite misbehavior. One of Solon's achievements, as I quoted earlier, is that he stopped the demos from churning up the milk and, and removing the cream. So um, violent revolution followed by um, murder of the um, upper class. The elite, Athenian elite was never powerful enough to uh, march members of the lower, lower classes en masse down the Laurian mines. And a graphic illustration of this is that not long after silver mining in Laurian began to reach significant levels of output, the Athenian demos rioted and established a constitutional order that put the people in charge, democracy. The overwhelming likelihood then is that in order to get silver mining underway, archaic Greek elites used slaves these slaves mined the silver that lubricated the nascent uh, Aegean economy and, in part, drove the remarkable economic efflorescence that has been the subject of much recent work. I emphasize uh, the words in part because my, name, my aim has not been to throw out the factors listed at item two, the drivers of growth um, on the handout, and place uh, slavery in their stead. And rather, I think slavery should be um, added to this list uh, and its role in monetization appreciated as a crucial element in the economic development of Greece in the 6th and 5th centuries BC. Uh, sorry for running 10 minutes of our time and thank you very much for your attention.